I think when you're new to contemporary art, you often don't know, am I allowed to like that? Am I supposed to dislike it? What, like, how do I engage with this artwork? And photography gives you permission to have an opinion. I'm Katie White, and this is The Art Angle, a podcast from Artnet News where the art world meets the real world, bringing each week's biggest story down to earth. How can art institutions adapt to meet the changing cultural landscape in the coming decades? And what are the new models that will evolve to fill these needs? Fotografiska, a private for-profit photography museum, is offering a novel possibility. Fotografiska's self-proclaimed mission is to offer a unique cultural destination where people can discover world-class photography alongside one-of-a-kind programming with top-tier restaurants and bars on site. With expanded late-night hours open until 11 p.m. on Fridays and Saturdays, Fotografiska believes it gives the public a more flexible platform for encountering culture than the traditional museum. But it's a model that's not without skeptics who worry that prioritizing Experience culture risks undermining curatorial rigor. Founded in Stockholm in 2011, today Fotografiska is a global enterprise with locations in Tallinn and New York. A Berlin outpost opened just last month at the Kunsthaus Tascheles, a destination with a unique cultural history for the city. This location debuted with exhibitions by celebrated artists, including Juliana Huxtable and Candace Brights. This month, the museum is opening a Shanghai location, the first in Asia. Behind Fotografiska's ascent is Joram Roth, the institution's chairman, a Berlin-based entrepreneur focused on arts and culture. With a career background that ranges from entertainment and music production to publishing, Roth brings a dynamic energy and unique vision to the art sphere. Recently, he joined us on the Art Angle to discuss the adapting institutional world, the state of photography today, and what he sees as the future of Fotografiska. Hello, Yoram. Nice to be speaking to you again, and welcome to the Art Angle. Hi, Katie. Excited to be here. I will say right off the bat, I brought back a cough or something from Istanbul where I was recently, and I will be coughing occasionally. So apologies, but it's not contagious across the podcast. (laughs) That's quite all right. (laughs) So... I think just to set the stage for our listeners who are maybe not familiar with Fotografiska, can you tell us its mission and a little bit about what sets it apart from what we typically think of as a museum? Well, I would love to. It's my favorite thing in the world to talk about. Fotografiska started in 2010. We're in our 14th year. And in a number of weird metrics, we are probably the largest photo museum in the world. In Stockholm, we have over 7,000 square meters. That's 75,000 square feet and more. And primarily, we started as a photography museum. Fotografiska is the Swedish word. It's an adverb. It means photographic, of a photographic nature. And so a lot of the exhibitions that we mount are photographic in nature, but we'll go cross-discipline into all kinds of other media that intersect or spring forth from the image. There's things we do differently. You know, we're not a collecting institution. We're an independent museum. And that means we get no money from the state, we get no grants, we get no donations. We ultimately have to hustle and cover our costs at the end of each year and move forward that way. And fortunately, we've been pretty good at that. There's a bunch of stuff we do differently, I would say. We will have three, four, sometimes five exhibitions up at any given time. And that's in the museum in Stockholm, for instance. When those shows will hang 12, 13, 14 weeks, whatever makes sense. But every few weeks, one of these shows gets replaced by what's next. And so we don't have a permanent exhibition. We constantly have new shows up and we are open late. Why does that matter? It means that our audience has time. We find that we are very attractive to a really culturally curious, well-educated young audience that frankly, would love to go to the museums, but often doesn't think about visiting a museum unless they're on holiday in another town. We tend to not go to our own museums because of their opening hours. So if a museum is open from, I don't know, 10 to 5 or 6, that's great for school classes or for people who don't have to work or for people who are tourists visiting. But for those of us who live in our own cities, we often really don't get to go. And we think of what we do not only the great exhibitions, like any museum, we have this ambition to fulfill an educational role. But rather than doing it by amounting a collection, 
it's more of a Kunsthalle approach, mm -hmm. honestly, a word that works in the art world, but is somewhat opaque to people outside of it. But we mount these exhibitions directly with the photographers or sometimes the estates or sometimes we'll do group shows. And by being open late and then by augmenting that with a lot of programming. So we will do a lot of artist talks. We will do workshops. We'll do educational programming, not always directly tied to the very images or the very photographer that we're showcasing, but also around topics of those exhibitions. It gives us an opportunity to get people to come back to the museum all the time, to be part of that programming, to see new exhibitions as they come up. And that's really on the exhibition side where we differ. I think the other thing that we do is, frankly, we are comfortable with people liking art. That's not to sound snotty, but I think there is, especially for those of us all here who love to spend time around contemporary art, some of the museums, some of those experiences can be a little exclusive. They can be a little intimidating. I think when you're new to contemporary art, you often don't know, am I allowed to like that? Am I supposed to dislike it? What, like, how do I engage with this artwork? And photography gives you permission to have an opinion. And so by being open late and getting a glass of wine at the bar and going through our exhibitions, which we can do throughout all our museums, you suddenly have much more of that gallery opening feeling than you do this high temple of museum. So we've been in Stockholm since 2010. 2016, we began our New York effort. We finally opened in 2019. And then we opened in Berlin a few weeks ago. And as coincidence has it, and it really is coincidence, we are also opening Fotografiska Shanghai on October 21st. So that's a great segue to talk about the Berlin location. I know it's located in a former squad. Can you tell me a little bit about the space? You're based in Berlin, if I'm correct. I am. If you can't tell by the accent, <laughs> I am German. I am German. <laughs> Can you tell me about how that came about and the exhibitions you have going on there? And then also Shanghai. I know you mentioned that that's a long effort as well and that these just coincidentally are coinciding so closely together. Yeah, unfortunately, Berlin is a year and a half late in its opening. We had hoped to open in April 2022. It's not our fault. We don't own that building. We don't own any of these buildings. We rent them. That building was delayed. It was handed to us much, much later. And so we now find ourselves opening two museums within six weeks of one another. So that's not usually what we do. Berlin is in what some who know Berlin may know as the old Tacheles building. It's on Oranienburger Straße. It was built at the turn of the 19th, 20th century as a shopping mall. But then after some time it failed. During the First World War, it was a hospital. Then it became, during the Second World War, it was actually partially a prison. It was also a headquarters for, I can't even imagine which wing of the nefarious Nazi party. I should have this research on me, but as a Jewish boy, I tend to just not even want to dwell on it. During the wall, it got bombed pretty heavily. It was mainly torn down in the Cold War years. A remnant was left over. It was scheduled to be fully demolished, I believe, in March 1990. But the wall fell four months before that, November 1989. An artist collective squatted it immediately upon the wall falling, as were a lot of buildings in Berlin. It wasn't certainly the only one. And Berlin became this great cultural landscape. There was a lot of these artist collectors, lots of different buildings. Full disclosure, I was one of these people. I had a techno label back in the day, and we would make both kinds of music, country and house. <laughs> techno and house is the joke. It's from an old movie. But um, <laughs> there was a lot of spaces. Tacheles ended up being occupied much longer than most of the other places. I think it was very cool for the first four or five years. I think then it sort of splintered up a little bit. It became a bunch of different people doing their own thing in this building. But it was, you know, it was interesting alternative art. And it was a great space. And people came to Berlin to see it and to wander it and to take photos of it. There was a really cool bar downstairs. And there was one ballroom sometimes where they played films or there was also techno parties there. So there was stuff. People had an association with it. Ultimately, it fell apart. I think the collective could never really figure out how it wanted to handle that space and how to engage with the owners and the city. And so it was emptied out in 2011. It's been empty since then. It's part of a very large area in the middle of Berlin and real estate developers took it over and now built like a whole bunch of groups of office buildings and apartments. It's all pretty fancy and high end. But they used very important architects like Herzog and Demeron, and they used uh, Armin Grüntuch and, and lots of other really good architects. So if you're into that, you will recognize certain parts of it as being really wonderful. But we're in this old building. The old building is about 5,000 plus square meters, so about 55,000 square feet. 
And we use all of it. We use it for exhibition spaces and we have that ballroom still and we use it for parties and for events and talks. We have a bar downstairs. So we're doing what we do. Can you tell me about some of the programming that is initiating the Berlin space right now? Yeah, the exhibition programming. I mean, it's great. The new show is something for those of you who have been to New York and Stockholm have seen. It's an exhibition by a number of female identifying photographers. I don't want to use the word wrestling, but certainly working with the human figure. And it's not necessarily about eroticism, but it is about issues of representation, about weight, about age. They're really important topics. Candice Brights is working with us in a very important video piece. It's called Whiteface, and it really deals with issues of racism. And I think in the U.S., that conversation is much further forward than it is in somewhat more homogenous countries like Northern Europe and Germany. There's still a lot of conversation to be had about race. And we have Juliana Huxtable, who is a multidisciplinary artist known for those of us who like dance music also as a DJ at Backhind. But she has a number of pieces, a video piece, some installation video pieces. I'm super proud of the program that we have in Berlin. It's a joy. We get to work with these incredible artists. And I really strongly recommend that everybody sign up to our newsletters and to our Instagrams and see because we have a constantly rotating program and it's really good stuff. We also heard that Peaches played at your opening party in Berlin. Peaches was teaching. Uh, It was incredible. She's somebody who's actually performed in that space 30 years ago. So for her, it was a triumphant return. She understood our audience. Our audience understands her very, very well. And that was a homecoming for her. That was a really great show. And as much as we are about photography, we took very little footage of that. (laughs) She was having fun. That was a great night. When is Shanghai opening and what can we expect there? Shanghai's October 21st is the first public day. We have an opening party October 20th. And it's wonderful there because I think, look, okay, so the weird coincidence has it that all our museums, there's a fifth one that I didn't mention. It's in Tallinn and Estonia. It's a franchise of what we do, but they're very close to us and we work very, very closely with them. But all our buildings are super old. They're all from the uh, late 19th century, early 20th century. And for those of you who know Shanghai or know China, there's a desire to build things new. Well, Finally, certainly the Shanghai region said, okay, we're going to take Jiang District, where there's a lot of old warehouses along the Shoju Creek, which is right off the Bund. And we're going to maintain all these old warehouses. And so we were able to get one of these old warehouses. Again, very big, four and a half thousand square meters, about 50,000 square feet. So we have a building that's also there from, I think, uh, I want to say 1913. In Shanghai, we're opening with Feng Li. We also have Edward Bortinsky. We have Fang Shi. And then we have Samson Young, who's doing video work. Much the same. We will have a rotating set of exhibitions. We will have a cafe where in the evening you can also get a glass of wine. We have a pretty cool concept shop. Fotografiska never does the typical museum shop. We tend to do more shops that are, you know, a little bit more about limited edition merch drops where we partner with certain companies or we do cool stuff with the artists. But then we also have little wonderful things that you just buy. So we're doing this in all our museums. Look, we do have certain artists. We've had the opportunity to work with all the biggest names in photography, whoever they may be. Uh, You know, Annie Leibovitz, Sarah Moon, Roger Ballin, David LaChapelle, Miles Aldridge. I mean, it's an endless list of people that we can work with. But we also try and mix that then with smaller, more emerging artists and those we tend to work with locally. We reach into the local community and we become a platform for artists from there. That is another question that I had for you, which is the exhibitions, do they travel between the different institutions or is it a combination of kind of local only exhibitions and then also traveling exhibitions? Some do. I mean, it's really a mix. When we get an opportunity to work with a major artist that we know will resonate through our audiences everywhere, we're going to want to work with them. You know, Miles Aldrich, we had a great show with. We want to show that in all our museums. But when there are certain exhibitions that topically may not necessarily be relevant. When we get to do a show in the U.S. that touches upon topics of, say, reproductive rights or gun ownership or migration, those topics are different in Europe. So there's no point in touring those shows. When we think about migration in Europe, we're talking about migration from Syria or Libya or more recently the Ukraine. Whereas in North America, we're really talking more about Nicaragua and Guatemala and places like that. It's a question of like what resonates with our audience. And then honestly, we also kind of want to work with the artists locally. And they're really, really cool. But we have great local artists in Berlin and we have great local artists in New York and we have them in Shanghai and we have them in Stockholm. So those sometimes travel. It's a question of how it vibes. 
there's a kind of more traditional view of a museum as a cathedral where there's the bastions of high culture that are given onto the public and Photographiska takes a very different approach in the kind of more social aspect that you've mentioned, drinks, bars, sometimes dance parties. And I'm wondering if you can tell me a little bit about that. What do you think that provides to someone that going to a museum might not? And if you can tell us, I know that there sure. is a membership to different <laughs> right. locations. The membership thing is awesome, although our membership is, you know, I think base membership is about 160, depending on the currency in the country you're in, it's about, about $160 a year. It's no different than becoming a patron at many of the museums that we love. Look, we're an independent museum, and I'll talk about that in a second. But if you think about sort of what makes up the museum, so you have these great, grand, state-funded, non-for-profit museums that we love and that I think fulfill an important role, whether it's the Tate Modern or whether it's MoMA or, you know, these are great places and we love them. And they take a very, very long view and they are institutions and it's incredible to be there. And it's even more incredibly to be tenured as a curator there. It's an incredible thing to be able to do. There are also these really cool private museums where people have an incredible private collection and they go beyond that and occupy a building or even build a building to showcase their collection or share it with other collectors. And those are also awesome. And I think it's great that those people are willing to share their stuff. We're a third way. We're this Kunsthalle and we do rely on making this work. So, you know, I kind of come from a hospitality background. So to me, the people coming to Fotografiska are not visitors, they're guests. And I think that a lot of the, especially the big contemporary museums that have been built over the last 30 years, they almost communicate a little bit that what goes on here within us is more important than you, the individual. And as somebody who grew up in socialist Berlin, that sort of rings the wrong bell in my ears. But yeah, there is a certain exclusivity, again, to come to this word, this idea that you're not really part of it, come in, ooh and ah, and then scurry off. Uh, hopefully through the gift shop. And that's that. We are comfortable with creating an environment where people actually enjoy themselves. I think it's this idea where people are like, oh my God, somebody's in the museum and all they want to do is selfie themselves. And it's like, no, you can do both. You can be culturally curious and you can tell your friends that you're having a really cool time doing something cultural. They're not mutually exclusive. Now, we actually don't have that many selfie moments. I think other museums do that better. But we do want to create the space where people, again, have permission to like what they see and to talk loudly about it with their friends. I think one of the things that sets Fotografiska apart for me from a typical museum is a lot of the kind of exhibition design. And I wonder if you can speak to the kind of creative exhibition design that the institution puts on. Yeah, thank you for noticing. <laughs> We're very proud of that. We have worked since day one with a Swedish team called Bunker and Vessel, who have helped us in our exhibition design. It's not just a question of putting up work on a gray wall. You really have to think about how are you presenting work? What are you doing with the walls? What set elements can you bring in? What props can you show? And how do we communicate the text on the wall? How do we present it? And that's a really big part of what we do. And so that when you come in and you move through the floors, you're distinctly in different moments. And yes, we underwrite them. Sometimes we underscore them, sometimes with music, sometimes with soundscapes. I think the word immersive has been a little bit overused and has also come on to mean something else now. But we certainly create exhibitions that are more than just photos on a wall. One question I would ask is, how do you think that your model makes Fotografiska more responsive kind of to the contemporary moment rather than a museum, say, for instance, where you have to spend years mounting an exhibition? I know you had told me separately about the Black Lives Matter movement and how in New York you guys were able to really pivot very dexterously. Yeah, I mean, that was a moment that I'm proud of the team for. You know, it was after George Floyd and it was already that summer and everything was insane. It was like, guys, we have this really great program and we're very proud of what we were about to show. We were like, we can't open our museum with this now. There's so much that we want to talk about. 
A lot of organizations talk about being diverse. Fotografska is a very diverse place, and we wanted to give that a voice. And so we scrapped the entire program. I mean, this was, you know, when was it? It was July 20. And then we were all hoping New York museums were going to be able to open August 20. And then last minute, the mayor then said no. And we got bunched in with other things, which to this day, I don't understand. You know, standing wide apart in an art space, not breathing each other's air felt like one of the safest things one could possibly do. What we did at that moment is we threw out our entire programming and completely reconfigured. Andres Serrano stepped up with a new exhibition and said, yes, let's show it now. We uh, worked with a Brooklyn artist called Naima Green, who brought out her archives and had done work recently. And then Martin Schella had done a series of work showcasing people that had been falsely accused on death row up to 18 years. We needed to talk about these topics. They were important. We did other things as well. I mean, during the protests... Everybody was boarding up. We're blocked from Madison Square. That's where everything was going on. Instead, our crew said, no, 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 no. We're going to stay in the museum. We're going to sit in the window. Want everybody to know who we are and what we look like. And then we opened up our doors during the hot days and said, all right, anybody who needs, you know, to charge their batteries or just use a clean bathroom and get some water or just chill in air conditioning, we can do that. And then we opened up our Instagram platform and other social media platforms and said, anybody who's ever really shot as a journalist or as a photographer, we can upload the images there to Creative Commons just to show a different side of the protest because, of course, media tends to get the seven images and then get out of there. And so I was really proud of what the team was able to do. And I understand that other major museums have a huge slog they need to get through in order to be able to do that. Where does your passion for photography come from? (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I've been doing this a long time. I don't know. I did photography in high school and I am 55 years old. I grumble under my breath. But back when that was a thing 40 years ago, I was doing photography and I loved it. And all the cool kids were doing photography. And, you know, we were in the dark room and we were listening to The Cure and we were listening to Susie and the Banshees and making really grainy images for our zines. And then I went to university to study the business of media and there was a bunch of different things we were able to do and I didn't really want to do the businessy stuff. I, I, I didn't mind the business. I, it, it, journalism was part of it and I like journalism but it wasn't something I could do so well because my English, whatever, the typing, all of it was my thing. But they said, hey, you can fulfill your journalism requirement with photojournalism. And I was like, yes, this I can do. And then one of the great moments of luck in my life happened. I was studying at Fordham in New York And a very famous American photographer called Larry Fink was teaching. And so I had the chance to work with Larry Fink for three years. And he's one of the grandmasters and a generous teacher. And so he would teach us everything from what temperature the water should be to shot composition, to art appreciation, to the big question of why. And when you're 19 or 20 and here's this guy, you don't even really understand who you're dealing with. And it's over the years that I've understood how awesome it was to have had him as a teacher. And so that kindled my love for photography forever. You've mentioned in speaking your passion for education and the role of education as being really primary to Fotografiska. Can you talk a little bit about that? And I'm wondering, are we talking about education in terms of people actually learning photography? We have a number of different things. In New York, for instance, we've done coursework. We work with major universities. We also offer just beginning courses. So it's a mix. If you're a member, the basic fun courses are part of it. We do have really high-end, serious courses with major photographers. Those cost some money because we have to obviously compensate the teachers and the people working. So we do it all. We're not a degree-granting institution. So a lot of it is sort of self-education, continued education, And some of it is very, very serious, some of which we've been successfully able to underwrite through the different camera manufacturers who like the opportunity to showcase their cool gear with somebody who knows how to use it and people who are interested in learning how to use it. And then sometimes we just have lighthearted stuff, you know, how to take a better selfie. One of our funnest courses in Stockholm, this was a couple of years ago, but it was great, was how to take a picture of your baby. Many of us dads run out and use it as another excuse to get a ridiculously, pointlessly overqualified camera. And then you want to learn how to use it. And so then you roll up on a rainy Tuesday afternoon and you get that glass of wine and you bring your baby and everybody sits and you you learn how to shoot. So that one's fun. It's not the only way to educate. You know, yes, we do photo courses, but I think there is also really a question of these other topics that we talk about. We had 50 years of hip hop up in New York. You know, we had a panel led by the mayor's office to talk about 
incarceration issues around cannabis over the last 30 years and how that's changing and how that primarily hit the black community. You know, there are topics about representation and gender when we talk about like with a new show that we also had in New York that's in Berlin right now. Those are really important exhibitions. And to get people around those topics and to have lectures and then to exchange on that after that is a really powerful thing. So I don't think it has to be about the specific image or the specificity of image making, but to have educational programming that cuts across topics that are relevant to us right now, I think is a role that we uniquely can fulfill at Photographiska. How do your curatorial departments work? Are they kind of independent at each location? I'm wondering like how the kind of consensus yeah. for these shows comes about and how they materialize. So every museum has a curatorial lead called the director of exhibitions, although they're all curators and they all have great education and skill sets. And then we have one lead across the entire global platform and she's based in Stockholm. So there's a committee of these people and I get to sit in on it as well, even though I'm the least educated of the group. And then we talk about what are the bigger shows that we're working on? How can we, we call it the Tetris, right? Because you have to make all these different pieces fit. And you want to make sure that you are thinking about the topics that you're covering and how long they're running and when they're on and how they interact with each other and how the mix feels in the space. But we do discuss them actively. So even if somebody wants to just bring a local show to Berlin or to New York, we still discuss it within that group. But ultimately, the local curator owns that decision and has to go to town with it. Do you see Fotografiska in another city in the future? Is this kind of going to be an international network or how do you conceive of it? And how would you kind of compare it to, you know, the Guggenheim or something like that? Another institution with a bunch of different locations. Oh, I love the opportunity to compare myself to the Guggenheim, who I love. And I think it's the coolest thing ever. I think we do see an opportunity to go to other cities. You know, I, I don't think it's that many. We do also look at this membership program. Again, our basic membership is really straightforward. But I think already at this time now, we have 10,000 members across the platform, and we believe that will double in the next year because we really only just started that membership program a couple of years ago. We want to be that third place. You know, we do want to be a place, this idea that you have work and you have home, and then where else do you go? And yes, you know, it used to be church or, you know, something like that. And, you know, in a perfect environment, the third place is a place you can go to for free. But certainly it's easy to get into Fotografska and the membership is not that much. And then, you know, to be surrounded by other people who are culturally curious, who want to talk, who want to exchange ideas is a great thing to do. And we see that in other cities. So we look at cities where we know is where the creativity comes from. And that's not to slag off certain cities, but there's some cities that just are obviously immediately things that make sense to us. And it's not always just the big names. Yeah, everybody loves Paris and London. That's awesome. But we've looked at cities like Istanbul. We've looked at cities like Tbilisi. We've looked at cities like Dakar or Accra, just north of that. There's so many different places. And we have a lot of incoming of people that say, hey, I want to bring Fotografiska to Sydney. I want to bring it to Sao Paulo. As much as that sounds awesome, it's a lot of work. Setting up a museum like this takes four years, at least. If you were to have an ideal kind of viewing experience or an experience of Fotografiska, what would it be? Oh, I love all my children equally. Um, <laughs> look, I'm selfish. I enjoy a good museum on a Tuesday morning when everybody else has to be in the office because I get it to myself. Our weekends can get kind of full. I love spending time with photography. I love spending time in the art spaces and I love walking through Fotografiska and seeing how we do these shows and having the sounds in the background and understanding what we do. Yeah, I'm not giving you the answer you want, but I really like them. <laughs> do you think that photography in some way is more open-ended? It's a medium that invites people in more? We all have 10,000 crap photos on our phone. You know, and so what happened is when Fotografiska started in Stockholm was roughly when the iPhone came out with the camera. And then everybody was like, oh, now that everybody's a photographer, is photography still even relevant? And the answer is, heck yeah, absolutely. Because I think now that everybody has understood that taking a picture is not just a button combination or, you know, like you have to have craft, you have to have skills, you have to have a point of view, you have to have an opinion, you have to have taste. And then maybe you can crank out 12 decent images a year. And so when you stand in a, especially in a museum, because I think we've all become very media savvy. You know, if you go back 200 years, 
you would see a painting maybe at a rich person's house or in a church or in a government building. And then over time, there was more imagery and pictures to a point now where we're confronted by five, 6,000 images a day, buses rolling by, magazines, we're scrolling, we're consuming news, we're looking at food videos from our mom. It's so much imagery that then when you do stand in a place like a photographer's and there's beautiful imagery on the wall, you have a very different experience to it. You know what they often say? They look at an incredible photo and the first thing they say is, oh, I could have never done that. Do you have a favorite photograph? Yeah, <laughs> of course. No, I don't know. It changes a lot. So yeah, I have lots and lots of photos that I like. I do. I personally collect photography, but my photography is a little bit different than what we show at Fotografiska. I have an emphasis on work that is interrupted, I want to say. It is cut open. It is burnt. It is stitched. It is painted on. It is collaged. I want the basis of it to be an image, but then have a unique work created from it that sits on top of that. And that has been the focus of my collection for the last several years, and I like where it's going. What do you see as the future of Photografiska and the future of photography? How do you think that they're intertwined? I think they're pretty closely intertwined. I mean, I think we are looking at... <sighs> there's so much easily usable tech now that the image making has become remarkable. The video crafting, I'm not going to get into the AI stuff. I think we're at the early stage of that. And I still do believe it takes an incredible amount of skills. I'm not the first person to say this. AI is not going to take your job. A woman who knows how to use AI is going to take your job. This is how that works. It's not about the computer. It's just another tool, but the tools have become so incredibly powerful in image making, in time-based work, in film, in video, in the augmented reality that we're getting work now into the museum. That's why the word photographiska is so perfect because it's photographic in nature. It can be this thing that lives beyond photography. I do like it as a starting point because, again, we have permission to like it. I think with a lot of the image making right now, I think a lot of people are like, well, I could do that if only I had the time. If I could sit down with ChatGPT or MidJourney for the next six weeks, I could probably eke out some cool images as well. I love the fact that we're now programming using natural language. Where I think, I don't know, 30 years ago, everybody was learning, I don't know what, like, I don't know, C++ or whatever. And then, you know, even using all respect to the Adobe products, but, you know, Photoshop or InDesign are probably harder than Excel. If you can just roll up to your computer now and type something in, or probably pretty soon also go directly speech to text and come out with remarkable creative work, let's see where it goes. Well, on that note, looking towards the future of photography, we can call it a day. Thank you for being on The Art Angle. Thank you. Thank you. Come by. Come to Photographiska. We're really super proud of what we do. We have one in Berlin. Now we have one in Shanghai in a couple of weeks and New York and Stockholm and Tallinn are great, great places. And the people work very, very hard to do really cool stuff. And I'm glad I was the one to represent them on this podcast today. Thanks so much, Yoram. Thank you. That's it for this week's episode. If you like what you heard, you can subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever else you get your podcasts. Also, take a moment to rate and review us. It will help other listeners discover what we're doing. The Art Angle is produced by Sonia Manalili and Caroline Goldstein. Thanks for listening and see you next week.